my name's Dave Harris. I'm an Emeritus Professor. I'm particularly interested in social theory and, on this occasion, in the work of Deleuze on his own and with various associates. Now, the thing is that Deleuze's work is very important and popular. But most people find it quite difficult to get into, especially if you're not a philosopher. So I've designed a series of videos for people who aren't philosophers, but who need to look at Deleuze's work. And this is the first one of them. What I do is to outline a particular approach and then go on in a later series of videos to illustrate it with terms like the rhizome or the body without organs or whatever. Now, you don't want to spend the next 15 or 20 minutes looking at me. So what I've done is to assemble a, a video of uh, local scenes and local walks in, in, around the area I live, which is Devon in the UK. And I'm going to put a soundtrack under that so you can look at these calming and soothing scenes and listen to me rabbiting on about Deleuze at the same time. The work of Deleuze on his own and the work he's done with Guattari and others can be very difficult to read by anyone's standards. I think the most popular book is actually the worst, A Thousand Plateaus, a massive 668 pages for a start. That book is written in a deliberately rambling style and it touches on a huge collection of topics. Birdsong, French literature, radical politics, psychoanalysis, avant-garde theatre, debates about linguistics and modern music. Strangely, it doesn't actually discuss education very much, even though lots of educationalists are keen on that book. There are some discussions of education in the work as a whole, but not in that book. I might even do a later tape to explore some of this particular work. The style can be described as classic French academic discourse of the kind once researched by Bourdieu and his associates. The first thing you need to realise about this is that such discourse is not intended to convey clear ideas or information. What it does instead is to demonstrate certain qualities expected in elite, well-educated people. It makes lots of allusions to elite culture, many of them implicit. There are things like references to Greek philosophy, great literature or poems, paintings or historical figures. Such discourse leaves lots of gaps for the educated to fill in for themselves. So, Plato is referred to by using a term from his work like the idea, spelt with a capital I of course, Weber or Goethe are indicated by using the term elective affinity. Althusser is being cited when academics use the term interpolation and so on. Well, these displays are not intended for people from other social classes. On the contrary, this discourse actually excludes them. It's reproduced because it shows that French professors have high status and they deserve it and they should be taken very seriously. Now, we're not saying that these values are made explicit, but they are widely shared nonetheless. The point is that Deleuze was exactly an example of the kind of professor that you would find at elite French universities during the period of the 60s and 70s studied by Bourdieu. Well, how do students from non-elite backgrounds react to this kind of academic discourse? Some manage, and they even enjoy the experience, but many do not. And Bourdieu tells us that those who do not enjoy the experience simply resign themselves to never being able to understand academic work. Some even convince themselves that the university is not for them after all, that they're really too stupid to cope and that they should leave. Others hang on by developing a series of desperate coping strategies. They might learn to echo back the professor's words without understanding them, 
or they can sometimes grab a few words and string them together somehow hoping that they make sense. Students like that learn to pose as academics hoping that their professors will probably turn a blind eye and not question them too closely. These days of course they might even risk a bit of plagiarism. However even if they bluff their way through they can still come to feel that they are imposters never really at home with academic work, never really deserving their degrees, always afraid that they will be caught out. And indeed they might. How does this connect with Deleuze and Guattari? Well, I'm arguing that they write in exactly this elite academic way. I'm not saying they mean to exclude us deliberately, rather that they think that this is how serious academic work should be written. They want to get us to think by making things challenging for us, bless them. They assume that we will all be well educated like them and secure enough to enjoy intellectual challenge. We will already know Freud's work, Proust's novel, the poetry of the Spanish surrealist Lorca, or have heard the unbroadcast plays of Antonin Artaud. There's also an assumption where no lots of other people, both D.H. and T.E. Lawrence, Virginia Woolf, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Carlos Castaneda, Raymond Roussel, Heinrich von Kleist and Pierrette Flirtiot. Now, what I've just done there is typical of academic discourse. I've mentioned a lot of names, I haven't spelled them, I haven't even referenced them. Now, I'm not giving a lecture, I'm not assuming you know who they all are, and I'm not going to discuss them any further, I'm just illustrating the style. And you will meet them in Deleuze and Guattari, often in this rather casual name-dropping sort of way. I think that Deleuze and Guattari expect us to read their work in a particular way. Now, I was actually able to read it in the approved way, but only because I'd retired. I read it for leisure. I took my time. I reread or abandoned bits and then came back to them. I often stopped and looked stuff up, quite usually on Wikipedia. I borrowed and I read some of Freud's work and Proust's novel. I even got through the novel, all 12 volumes of it. I found Lorca and Arto on the web. I had my own copies of that cult writer of the 1970s, Carlos Castaneda. I bought second-hand copies of Roussel and Kleist on Amazon. Reading lots of commentaries also helped. I started to see something of what Deleuze and Guattari were on about, but I was under no pressure. I had no assessors to demand that I demonstrate my understanding. I had no deadlines to work to. I had no distractions like having to mark lots of student essays or attend meetings or grind out articles for government assessment. I was able to make a series of leisurely notes on most of the works for my own benefit. I even managed that for a thousand plateaus. I've published these notes on my website so you can read them if you wish and I'll put up the URL of the website at the end of this tape. Now I can hear some people saying well that's all very well for you but none of that happens to fit me. I'm stressed enough at work as it is. I didn't read to choose this stuff, like you did, but I was strongly advised to do so by my supervisors. I'm on a postgraduate course. I've got to finish my dissertation next year. I've intruded on family life enough as it is. So how the hell am I supposed to read A Thousand Plateaus? Well, my suggestion would be first that you do not do any of the things discussed by Bourdieu and that we've mentioned above. Don't drop out thinking that you're too dim to ever get anything out of Deleuze. 
Don't be intimidated. Do not try to pick up a few bits and pieces here and there. Maybe a few key words like rhizome or body without organs and then desperately string them together in some vague and vacuous bullshit that might get you through if the examiners are feeling soft. Even if you succeed, you'll still believe that you are an imposter. You'll lose sleep thinking that you might be found out. And indeed you might be. I'm going to argue that you can get something out of Deleuze and Guattari using your own mental and educational resources that you possess already. Then you can go back and get more. And then go back and get more until you've done enough. There it will be no immediate transfer of meaning from these two French intellectual giants writing 40 years ago to a modern postgrad student. We have to work steadily at it in stages. The approach I outline in my videos involves working away at some key concepts as the way to begin. I've chosen the ones everyone seems to want to discuss, like the rhizome. And what I do is propose that we try to find all the examples of the term in a thousand plateaus, even using the index, and then we try to work out what the actual concept is that joins them all together. The good news is that you do not have to try to immediately plough through a thousand plateaus, page by page. I've known people who've tried that and it's put them under huge pressure. Don't try it unless you have the time and leisure enough to read it nice and gradually with lots of pauses and interruptions like I did. Even then, sometimes I found it a real strain. Now, of course, working with key concepts is not going to be a technique that's useful for all readers. This is certainly not a technique for those who think that the text is poetry and should be read slowly and savoured for its beautiful language and personal effects. It's not a technique for expert Deleuzeans who know that there is a substantial break in the work with the sort of normal reasoning that we are going to employ at first. I'll try to point out some of these reservations as we go along. But what I'm saying is that you can start by researching specific concepts to a reasonable extent and getting a good working knowledge of them for yourself. Even though this will only be a partial understanding until you can find the time to read more widely. Well, the videotapes I've posted show how this is going to be done. I've chosen the rhizome, the hexiety, the body without organs, and then a discussion of what a concept is for Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, I think we'll only be in a position to find that out at the end. And meanwhile, we can just assume that a concept is a term used in an argument. You can then go on for yourselves to use the same technique on other famous concepts like the fold, the refrain, faciality, smooth and striated space, and the war machine. I might put in a tape on education since so many educationalists seem to want to discuss Deleuze and Guattari, and if I've got time, I might do tapes on some of the other concepts as well. However, that's enough for one session. I'll leave you with a few captions so that you can look up a couple of references. And then I'm off.